Hi, this is Dr. Barnes. Welcome to our third Foundry staff training video for 2020. Uh, this is, in my mind, one of the most important uh, because it has to do with employee wellness and employee satisfaction and uh, keeping people uh, actively employed, uh, and it's on compassion fatigue. So the title of this uh, is Understanding and Preventing Compassion Fatigue. And so when we begin to look at compassion fatigue, I think the, the bottom bullet on this slide is probably the most important. When we talk about when we mix burnout from being exhausted and dissatisfied in the work environment or frustrated or, you know, just, you know, um, well, exhausted from day-to-day -day work, and we add the experience of secondary trauma on the part of employees, we get a... Um, basically a reaction that we call compassion fatigue. And the definition by Lombardo and Iyer, uh, I really like, and it says, a combination of physical, emotional, and spiritual depletion associated with caring for patients or clients in significant emotional pain and physical distress. And as Figley says, it's the cost of compassion for a client's pain. And the idea is that if we care about our clients, and we listen to them, and we have empathy and compassion. Uh, and the, the difference between um, empathy and compassion, again, is that um, compassion is empathy with a desire or belief that we should be able to do something about it. And with so many of our clients, uh, there's only so much we can do, and that we will at times become frustrated in that process. So again, Fig Lee says, the cost of compassion for a client's pain. And the term compassion fatigue was uh, defined or coined by Carla Joynson. Carla was a professor at UCLA in Los Angeles, and she was studying um, nurses who work in the emergency room and was looking at the job experience, what were the factors that were most stressful for them or most traumatizing for them. And... Um, what they really came up with was, a, was the term compassion fatigue and really the belief that compassion fatigue was about burnout. And uh, when I was at Florida State, we were studying secondary trauma or vicarious trauma of therapists and other helpers. And Dr. Joynson um, sent a letter to Dr. Figley saying, you know, I think we're studying the same thing. Uh, I think we call it different things. And so we began to look at Compassion fatigue is really kind of both. It's the combination of um, burnout and this idea of secondary trauma. And so Joynson says there are four reasons that uh, understanding compassion fatigue for anyone who works in the helping professions. Um, and the first is that it's really emotionally devastating. And when you work with clients who are really struggling emotionally and working with clients who have a lot of trauma and they're sharing uh, the the trauma stories and the narratives, and they're exhibiting great um, autonomic nervous system dysregulation, and they're up and down and aggravated and agitated, that, that we begin to take on some of that, and that we experience our own sense of sadness and grief, depression and exhaustion associated with the pain of these people that we've come to uh, care about uh, in the time that they've been with us. The second is the caregivers' personalities lead them to it. And the idea that I always say is that if you don't have compassion for our clients, then you're pretty safe. You're never going to get compassion fatigue. But the fact that we are in this field and we understand who we're dealing with and how we're dealing with um, their issues and what we're dealing with, with their trauma, it just leads us to get involved and to care, sometimes care too much. Three, the outside sources that cause it are unavoidable. You know, clients come in, there have been overdoses, uh, deaths that they have been dealing with, trauma, sexual assault, um, automobile accidents, their own near-death experiences, you know, grief and anger, uh, conflict. They all have this real personal cost, not only on the client, but on us. And this is... That's a, a really good example of what we would consider vicarious traumatization. And then the last is the compassion fatigue is almost impossible to recognize uh, without a heightened awareness of it. And we usually say that the person who has it is the last person to recognize that they have it. 
And that's why it's really important for um, we as a clinical team and with the techs and the administrative teams that we really take care of each other and we really pay attention that if someone has always been very social and kind of hangs out, has lunch with us and suddenly they start isolating and they're not around very much, that it really um, would be um, appropriate for us to go to that person and to say, hey, we're worried about you. You know, you, you seem to be pulling away. Is everything okay? And again, they would be the last person to see that they had that. So if we look at the trauma continuum and um, uh, look at, like, what are we really talking about? Um, it's the third um, in the continuum. Primary trauma is the survivor of specific traumatic events, individuals who have witnessed events, um, you know, um, first responders, those kinds of folks as well. Secondary trauma is um, our experience of um, compassion or being traumatized by the traumas that are experienced by people that we either work with or that we really care about, our family members. And that's why, you know, first responders, um, ER docs, um, you know, midwives, all, all kinds of helping professionals experience the secondary trauma associated with working with uh, sick or very ill or highly traumatized clients. And if we put together this issue of burnout and that secondary trauma, we call that compassion fatigue. And there's also a concept called organizational trauma. And that usually happens whenever some major traumatic event happens that causes an organization to have to deal with like a sudden reorganization or the grief or loss of, of a loved leader. Uh, sometimes it could happen, like the term um, chiasmal trauma is when an event happens um, to a member of a system, and the, the, the term was uh, actually identified in a study that was done with the Cleveland Police Department. And they were studying what happens when uh, an officer is either killed or injured, and how does that impact the rest of the team and the, uh, the functioning of the organization itself. And so it could be that kind of thing, or it could be that um, individuals are promoted into a higher level in the organization, a more management position, but they've never come to terms with their own compassion fatigue. And so we'll talk a little bit about that, but we're going to focus mostly on compassion fatigue that we have all experienced as, as helpers. And so as we look at the two issues, I always use this um, infinity symbol primarily because um, the issue of burnout or, or what is often known as organizational stressors. And organizational stressors are associated with um, you know, frequently changing policies and procedures, a lack of support from management. Um, there's a whole list that we'll talk about um, in a few minutes. Um, but Organizational stressors are at the foundation for most people's experience of burnout. Um, and again, we'll go through that to greater uh, uh, degree. And so organizational stressor, um, you know, so what it does is that it exhausts us to a point where those defenses that we typically use to say, I care about this client, uh, but but I know where I end and I know where they begin. And their struggles um, make me sad, but, but they're not my struggles. And so what we found is the more exhausted, the more burned out, the more disillusioned um, a, uh, a staff member is from burnout, that they often, uh, because of that reduced ego defense system that, the, that they're experiencing, the things that clients say to them that in the past would have been you know, um, difficult, but would not have caused a, a real trauma response. Um, but so the, the more experience of burnout or organizational stress, the more likely we are to experience secondary trauma or what we call operational stress. And operational stress is stress associated with carrying out our work with clients. And so, um, you know, 
the more greater or more difficult the narrative or story that the client tells us, the more likely we are, if we care about them, to experience some level of a vicarious trauma meaning we, we get it from interacting with them. We see this with parents of kids who have been traumatized as well. And so we, we may experience some of the same symptoms that traumatized clients might experience. Intrusive thoughts, like we're home and we could be playing with our own kids, but we're thinking about our clients and we're thinking about, you know, did they get you know, the medicine that they were supposed to get today, something along those lines. We might have our own defensive avoidance of things that we should be worrying about, but um, they make us too anxious to worry about them. Uh, so it could be that we have the experience of a significant secondary trauma from an event that happens with a client or something we've been told by a client that... Um, makes it harder to go to work because we're constantly reminded of that. And so we may experience uh, initial trauma with increased burnout, or we may have increased burnout that makes us more susceptible to increased um, opportunity for being traumatized. And so um, I, I do think that burnout or organizational stressors are primary, are, are, are um, probably the, the more frequently experienced um, initial um, um, you know, stressors, uh, but that does make us far more susceptible to that secondary traumatic stress. So it's important to understand that, you know, we come to work for a variety of reasons. And in the very first video, I talked about the fact that so many people come to our organization with no real history of working in behavioral health. And uh, for those of us who've you know, been working in behavioral health for, for me, it's been 36, uh, almost 37 years, that um, the reasons that I'm drawn to the field may be different than someone who is newly hired as a tech. And so um, there are five... Um, uh, values that people generally try to meet in the work environment. And the first is material values. How much money do I make? The second is achievement values. Um, you know, can I work my way into uh, being promoted to where um, I can um, you know, demonstrate my skill set and my value to the organization? The third is a sense of purpose. Um, I'm really helping people that are in need of my assistance. Uh, the fourth is social relationships. I'm working with a group of people that are like-minded, that I really um, enjoy working with. And number five, enhancement or maintenance of the self-concept. And the idea that um, I not only like it here, but I feel good working here. And that I think that working in a caring, helping environment um, may make me a better person in the long run. And so when you look at those five core kind of work-related values, it, you know, you can see that the more we experience stress, and depending on the source of the stressors that, that we're having, it could minimize or diminish uh, our ability to meet our values in any of those five areas. So if you look at the green um, um, sentence that says a lack of any of the five values in the work environment may serve as a significant stressor and threaten the employee's perceived physical and psychological well-being or self-esteem. Um, and the one that I think is, is really associated with burnout is five, the enhancement or the maintenance of self-concept, because when we begin to experience burnout, the first thing we experience is a sense of disillusionment where we begin to question whether you know we're really cut out for this kind of job. And so um, you know, I, I think it would be useful for all employees who watch this to look at those five uh, values and to begin to assess which, which of those are you getting met in your work at the foundry and in your day-to-day -day activity with clients and your interactions with managers and supervisors, um, are there certain areas of those five 
that uh, five values where your experience of foundry as a work environment sort of challenge or diminish any of those five and so um, again it, it opens the door for compassion fatigue both burnout or secondary trauma and so let's start with burnout and what is it and so often people assume that uh, burnout is really just being exhausted. It's like from doing the same things over and over and, and eventually you get either bored or you get tired. And that's that's really not what burnout is. Burnout um, is is really a, and again, we'll see in the next slide, that it's caused by a sense of disillusionment or a lack of support, perceived support, I should say. So burnout is a state of physical, emotional, and mental exhaustion. Or as uh, Eric Gentry would say, that the deleterious effects the environmental demands of the workplace have on the worker. How many hours do I have to work? How much overtime do I have to work? How much? Uh, how many difficult clients am I working with? And that the environment, either the management environment, policies and procedures, or the difficulty of the clients at it from any, you know, one week to another uh, to the next week, may cause us to experience less. Of those uh, any of those five values and so the next one is uh, Eric uh, Kotler um, w w is an author who wrote a book um, for counselors it's kind of a counselor training guide and uh, he says that he believes that burnout has actually um, been given the wrong name and that he thinks it should be called rust out because it happens much slower and it's almost impossible to see until one day you look and you realize, wow, that everything's kind of rusty. Everything um, looks like uh, doesn't look very neat and tidy like it did. And I love the way he describes it. And he said, Be, it, it's, it's a much better term, rust out is a much better term because it represents the slow, gradual progress that eats away at a caregiver's spirit. And oftentimes we will see people who will come and work in this environment be very energized and, and um, suddenly over the course of time they become more and more frustrated or more and more withdrawn. And we begin to see that spirit go. The reason burnout's really so important is uh, there are two reasons. that um, um, it, Burnout is the leading cause of reduced compassion satisfaction what that really means is the reduced job satisfaction. And the people may love certain aspects of their job, but if they're exhausted and if they're disillusioned, that they begin to find fault uh, with the work environment. The second one is that the more um, compassion fatigue that we see, the more it's experienced within a work team, the more people will start to use the term toxic workplace. And so the more employees experiencing it, the more employees will begin to experience the environment from a negative perspective. These are some of the, the reasons that employees um, give for experiencing burnout. Lack of control in the work environment, um, you know, like a high demand, uh, plus a lack of control. You know, we don't always know what's going to happen. Someone has a seizure. Someone needs to go to the doctor. Needs to go to the hospital. Someone needs to be picked up. And uh, you know, we're a person short, and suddenly um, everyone has to shift or alter um, what they're doing, which feels m um, more and more out of control for them. Lack of empowerment to make decisions. You know, as I said in the first video, we're um, we are governed by the Office of Behavioral Health for our state license and the Joint Commission for our uh, accreditation, and they tell us so much of what we're allowed to do, not allowed to do, how to do it, what our targets are. Our policies and procedures are written specifically to address those two groups, and oftentimes employees will think, well, you know, I think it would be better if we would do this with the client, and then we begin to look and say, well, that's um, because of our Joint Commission accreditation, uh, that would be considered too dangerous. Uh, a lot of people talk about poor communication, and even though we might have, you know, um, all kinds of different communication uh, forms or formats with email, with Basecamp, with Kipu, uh, a lot of times things get lost in translation. And as much as we try to communicate in a in a really consistent way, that oftentimes it's really um, perceived or experienced by employees as poor communication. 
insufficient orientation to the job, you know, we've been trying to do a much better job with that. But oftentimes, if people aren't oriented um, to what they're supposed to be doing or what their job entails, they will often experience um, a sense of being highly stressed and uncertain. Um, high workloads, uh, work overloads, as our um, numbers of clients increase over the course of time, uh, oftentimes it can, um, even though I will assure you that having worked in treatment centers all over the, you know, in Florida and Pennsylvania and here, um, our, our, our actual client to patient ratios never go as high as they have in virtually every other treatment center I've worked at. There are times when it feels like we don't have enough staff for the number of clients that we have. But, um, you know, again, perception is uh, way more important than um, reality in many cases, depending on how people feel. When I was at CEDAR, which is at a program at the University of Colorado Health in, in um, Aurora, um, I did studies every year with our staff, and um, these were the reasons that our staff generally, uh, in the last survey, survey I did about five years ago, these were their sources of burnout. Poor communication between peers, teams, supervisors, and departments. And that's why we all need to be responsible for communicating um, within the policies and procedures to the best of our ability. They talked about too much change. That we were often changing our policies and procedures in order always with an attempt to make things better, but that that was sometimes hard for people to keep up with. Rules not being well articulated or not followed consistently by staff. Um, interesting that at CEDAR people talked about certain patients being given special privileges, um, administration, uh, administration reactivity, um, you know, making rules without thinking them through very well, uh, difficulty of patients, verbal abuse, lack of respect, um, personality disorders, co-occurring disorders, peer negativity, sloppy or negligent work, negative attitudes, people not actually living up to, the, to their policies and procedures, actually not um, uh, living up to their responsibilities, uh, staffing struggles, uh, being understaffed, and then the last is a lack of support. Um, um, I always remember uh, one of the employees saying that, you know, as a management team, rather than ready, aim, fire, that consistently... Uh, it always felt like we were ready, fire, aim, and that we never really thought things through. And I think um, I can certainly understand how that can be an experience. Um, but I can assure you that these decisions are always made with the best intentions possible. So um, Maslach is the one of the uh, top uh, burnout r researchers in the country, and, and she kind of looks at all of these various factors and reasons and says that um, there are really three dimensions to burnout. And the first one is disillusionment. And that um, unlike the, the belief is that exhaustion is first, it is the disillusionment that I, um, I'm not very effective in, in my job. And as those values begin to be diminished, People begin to question their the role that they play in the organization, but they also begin to experience disillusionment about the company and about management and all, and all of those other things. And so people begin to feel that we're, that they're not good at their job, and they also may feel that the organization is um, is not as supportive or um, um, doesn't allow them to do the things that they thought they would be allowed to do. And so I've, I've included just a couple that, client, uh, that, that former staff uh, have said to me as roots of the disillusionment. Um, and they talked about the greater the imagined success and power, the greater the potential for disillusionment. And this is often the case with therapists or counselors where they you know, um, um, think they're going to be able to do therapy with cases in a way um, that maybe doesn't fit our our clinical model. 
And so they begin to feel disillusioned that they're not going to be able to do what they really thought they would be able to do. Um, I thought I'd have more say in my day-to-day -day work activities. I thought I had more say in my schedule. Um, you know, we worry more about charting than we do about really helping the clients get what they need, I've heard people say. And uh, I'm not able to use the tools that I've learned in school. And so um, this, you know, this isn't what I thought I was getting myself into. The longer we work in an environment where we tend to feel disillusioned, uh, the more exhausted we get. And that it's hard to go to work every day to a place that we don't feel enriched or that we don't feel um, kind of supported. So exhaustion can also be related to this great need for services that it seems like we're always doing something new, always adding something to the to the treatment model. And so, um, you know, it's hard to go to work in a place where we don't feel that um, we're a key player in the success of the, of the program. And the last one, uh, in, in my mind, the one that's most important from a team perspective is um, a growing sense of cynicism. Uh, resulting from the unrealistic expectations and a lack of resources. And the, the best definition of cynicism that I've ever heard is thinly disguised contempt. And what that really means is that um, people become angry that they're in a situation or um, that isn't what they thought they were getting into, and they get more cynical, they get more um, angry, they get um, snarky, a lot of really dark gallows humor, um, talking negatively about clients behind clients' back, talking about each other behind other staff members' backs, talking about management and those kinds of things. And so, you know, every place I've ever worked had a certain amount of that um, just because it's, a, it's an easy way to blow off steam. But if we're noticing more and more cynicism on the part of staff, then I think we need to be paying particular uh, attention to um, how exhausted the staff is. And we will often do that. We do that as a leadership team and um, you know, try to do something that would be fun or something that would kind of break the tension. And so I would ask you if you've had this experience, and I've certainly uh, experienced all of those at, at different par points in my career, um, what is your motive for working in this field? If it's really just to have a a job that's going to um, be um, fine as long as you're willing to kind of work and learn and, and embrace the culture of the behavioral uh, health care field. Um, you know, a lot of people become therapists because of the, the families that we grew up in and things like that. So um, uh, to begin to look at um, what is your motive for being in this world and if you're frustrated, uh, I'll talk about some things that we can do to feel better. And I would urge you to really begin to look at um, maybe there's some things that you could do differently that would make this experience uh, significantly better for you. And so before we go into vicarious trauma and chiasmal trauma, just uh, that reminder of how does someone get traumatized. And they get traumatized either through personal experience of an event that involves death or actual or threatened serious injury, but also witnessing things. You know, there are times where we may witness someone having a seizure or something that is really scary to us, uh, someone who goes into withdrawal and has a medical uh, response to that, an injury at a wellness activity or something along those lines, um, or learning about an unexpected death or uh, serious harm. And so often, just sitting around talking to the clients and listening, you will hear the, the horror stories or the war stories that they tell about um, their, their traumatic experiences. And all three of those can actually um, create a post-traumatic response in those of us who work in the field and who care about the client. And then the fourth on that page is uh, something that was just added in our last... Uh, diagnostic manual uh, that came out. It's the fifth. I think came out in fourteen, um, and and it's the idea that first responders and certain people work in a in a field or in a work environment 
where they are constantly experiencing repeated or extreme exposure to aversive details of traumatic events. And I don't think we experience that as much as like police officers and first responders because of the kinds of work that they do at accident scenes and things like that. But I think we are highly susceptible to vicarious traumatization. And so vicarious traumatization is defined as a single member of a system, someone who works in an organization, a therapist or a tech or any of us, um, is affected due to regular contact with traumatized individuals. And um, McCann and Perlman uh, coined the term in 1995, and they were really looking at therapists who work um, in the emerging kind of trauma-informed kind of treatment world. And I really liked their comment that says, it is the accumulation of memories of clients' traumatic material uh, that affects and is affected by the therapist's perspective on the world. That's one of the things that we often see is that if we work with traumatized clients long enough, it does alter our worldview. And I will tell you that I've been in the field for such a long time that there's really very little that I can hear at this point that um, I haven't heard before. And I sometimes worry that it has changed my, my worldview to seeing the world um, different than I did as a young man. And the key to being able to um, combat vicarious trauma is the establishment of very healthy boundaries and the establishment of a really established uh, social network of people that you can talk to whenever you have these kinds of experiences so, uh, and healthy self-care activities. And so we're going to be doing another video on boundaries. And uh, as much as we need to be uh, friendly and supportive and caring, um, it is not a friendship relationship. And so we will talk about that, um, I think, um, within the next couple weeks, we're going to have an, um, a tech meeting to talk about that. So vicarious trauma is one on one or one person who's impacted by all of the information that's happening around us in the group. Chiasmal trauma and chiasm is defined as the crossing of two paths and it's all, we also call it secondary trauma. It's where an entire system, an entire work team can be infected by a trauma experienced by one client. And so um, I could give you a couple examples. The one that is the best example was when I was at Cedar, we had a young man who came through our program. He went through our detox program. He went through our residential program, which was 30 days. He went through our PHP program and he went through our IOP. And um, so he was in our organization for somewhere around six months altogether. And we got a phone call one day that he had um, committed suicide. And so since he had been in all of our programs, I stepped, I, I wanted to address our staff. And if you look at the slide, you can see that the patient who committed suicide his parents were part of our family program for that entire time. So think how many people had contact with that client over the course of the six months that he had been a client, with his family, who had been a part of our program, and his roommate, who found him. The roommate had been through all of the programs in our facility as well. And so I um, just basically identified every single person or every single position in our organization that knew the three people and it was every employee in the whole com company and so that this one individual um, had the um, connection with the entire organization on some level to where um, we experienced a significant what we caused called chiasmal event and we debriefed and we worked with the staff and we worked with those teams. And so um, it's really a recursive process and recursive basically means that it's systemic. Uh, as, as one person impacts 
another person, that person impacts another person, and it, it's like um, ping pong ball going back and forth. And so, again, individuals will experience the exact same symptoms uh, of post-traumatic stress, which we'll talk about in a minute. So when I was at Cedar and I was doing my study with them, these were the things that the, the, the staff members said were the greatest sources of secondary trauma for them, um, whether it be vicarious or chiasmal. And so stories of sexual trauma, um, patient anxiety and social phobias, and the, the, just being around such anxious uh, clients all the time, um, narratives around homeless experience and the danger that clients were in uh, for such long periods of time countertransference uh, in which um, we have a biopsychosocial reaction to our clients based on the families that we grew up in or um, our families of origin. Um, a lot of grief narratives the clients told, anger and panic, uh, fear responses of clients, uh, patients' histories of abuse, um, activities that put their life at risk. And so you think about how often clients tell us these kind of war stories about their experience when using, and that uh, it, those stories don't go unheard, and they don't go unnoticed, and they don't, uh, and they, and they don't have minimal impact. They have pretty significant impact um, on, on our staff and on us. So I hope this makes sense, the idea that we can be burned out by policy and procedure issues, you know, manager issues, and then we can be traumatized by the stories that our clients tell us. And that as they kind of go back and forth and we're experiencing both, they can um, become what we call compassion fatigue. So is trauma an issue in the addiction counseling field? Absolutely. And so Bride, Hatcher, and Humble did a study back in 2009 where they studied 242 NADAC members. The NADAC is the National Association of Alcohol and Drug Abuse Counselors, and it is our national um, um, professional organization. And they studied them to see what was the likelihood that, that these um, NADAC members had symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. And what they found was that 56% of the people that they studied met one criteria, and there are five cri basic criteria uh, for post-traumatic stress disorder. 28% of the people that they studied met criteria for two. 19% met full criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder. That's a, you know, 20%. That's a fifth of all of the professionals um, working in the field actually were wrestling with um, not just trauma, but a but a significant amount of trauma response that it meets the criteria for a diagnosis of PTSD. That's significant. And that does not take into account at all the developmental trauma that we as professionals may bring with us from our families of origin into the field. And so when they began to look at specific symptoms, 43% of the individuals that they studied had experienced thoughts about work when they were not trying to think about work. They had intrusive thoughts, just like clients do. 27% reported detachment from others in their lives. And so uh, when they get home, you know, it takes a lot of energy to be in an intimate relationship. It takes a lot of energy to have friends and to be social and to go out and do things. And that, um, you know, a quarter, a little over a quarter of all of the people that they studied had begun to pull away from the social relationships, either intimate relationships or, or friend relationships um, because of the trauma that they were experiencing in their lives. 30% um, reported emotional numbing or dissociation, 26% sleep disturbances, and 30% reported irritability. And again, those are significant numbers. Uh, Brian Bride um, and another person, uh, Kitzel, uh, did another study where they were really looking at job satisfaction. And they found that addiction counselors who scored high on secondary trauma reported lower job satisfaction and occupational commitment, which meant that the more traumatized they felt by working with clients, the more likely they were to leave their job and go to another, uh, to another job, and in many cases leave the field. 
high job satisfaction, if they really enjoyed their uh, jobs and felt empowered, fully mediated the impact of secondary trauma. And so if um, even in highly traumatizing environments, if there was low burnout and low um, uh, operational or uh, organizational stress, people stayed in their job and liked their jobs more. And so you can see where both come into play at that point. Uh, the symptoms, many of them are the exact same symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, re-experiencing traumatic events, recollections, sudden intrusive thoughts, dreams, nightmares, uh, avoidance or numbing, depression, dissociation, uh, trying to avoid or disconnect uh, from things. And that's one of the reasons that people tend to um, not want to be in the work environment. They leave their job because just being in at the ranch or around the 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 gym, uh, uh, you know, around the clients, um, there are so many sensory triggers that are experienced that kind of bring back those feelings. That that's one of the reasons there's such high turnover, diminished interest in activities. Uh, the research is interesting with compassion fatigue. That the activities that we typically use to feel better are the first activities that we tend to let go. And so I, I've worked with a lot of nurses and, and other professionals who have said, I used to uh, run, I used to exercise, I used to dance, I used to you know, bowl, I used to do all these things. And when I asked them, well, what do you do now? They say, typically, um, uh, you know, I watch Ellen. I'm exhausted. I go home and um, it's barely, I barely have the energy to take care of my kids. And then the last one is persistent arousal, anxiety, hypervigilance, irritability, outbursts, easily annoyed, difficulty concentrating, um, easily. So these are the uh, startled. These are the things that we work with clients on a regular basis in all of these things. So it's important for us to also help and work on ourselves. These are some of the other symptoms that we experience. Um, and they're all really significant. Physical symptoms, headaches, digestive problems, diarrhea, constipation, all of these things that if we understand what's going on in the body, if we're living in a high state, high anxiety state, all the blood is leaving the internal organs of our body, going to our arms and legs and brain and eyes so that we can uh, survive in a high stress environment. It's no wonder that people have gastrointestinal problems, stomach upset, um, constipation, and those kinds of issues. Uh, living in a constant state of tension. Again, sleep disturbances, fatigue, chest pains, things like that. Emotional symptoms that people may experience. Mood swings, restlessness, irritability, uh, being a little oversensitive, anxious, um, uh, smoking more, drinking more. Uh, smoking, uh, I mean, clearly, um, it, is, um, it is our policy that you would not be um, uh, using any substances that were illegal or any substances beyond um, what would be considered social use, but some people find that they begin to use more. Depression, anger, uh, memory issues, poor concentration, um, and then the last is work-related. Avoidance or dread of working with certain patients. Um, intensive care uh, nurses talk about that all the time. That, that the minute they walk in on onto the intensive care unit, they look at their list of clients to see who they've been assigned to. Because if they're assigned to that patient, they know their day is going to be ruined. Um, reduced ability to feel empathy. Um, you know, just do your job. Don't feel anything. Don't be compassionate. Use of sick days, exaggerated sense of responsibility, being like, I have to make sure these things happen. So, you know, there are just so many different symptoms. Um, this is a really important one. And that what we find with, uh, with systems, and this is from some research that I did uh, on intensive care units, is that the longer the organization, the longer clients, the longer employees um, kind of live in that fight or flight response, the more they begin to think about personal vulnerability, safety, and control. 
And so what begins to shift is rather than just enjoying work or going to work and um, fulfilling their work responsibilities, that they begin to kind of um, become hyper vigilant for any kind of slight, any kind of frustration. They try to be, they, they try to control things so that they can feel safe. And so as people become more and more burned out, particularly with growing cynicism and exhaustion, they begin to focus more on their own well-being rather than the overall needs of the clients and the organization. So employees begin to question supervisors' abilities, motives, and ability to keep the department safe. And we see this a lot, particularly when the census is really high and we have someone out on vacation. Oftentimes, employees will break into kind of cliques um, that alter the culture of the team. And so we begin to see people um, with a lot more um, oh, talking behind people's back, um, rumors, um, yeah, just complaining about safety, um, vulnerability, you know, that really becomes the, the primary focus of the employee. And so we, we often see that as a perception begins to shift with, with that shift from kind of basic uh, meeting the objectives of the organization to safety, that um, uh, rumors, gossip, private conversations, closed boundaries uh, guide the narrative about the organization, about the unit, about the clients, and people begin to focus more on perception of what's going on than they do about what's really happening. And it, you know, you'll begin to hear rumors of things that, that are said to be happening that just aren't happening. And so um, I would really urge people to begin to look at you know, how have perceptions of the work environment, perceptions about clients, about the families that we work with, begin to shift over time and to be more open to the idea of doing some reality testing with other employees. Okay, we're going to jump to... This is um, the last of the um, um, slides that we're going to talk about before we get into what to do about it. And so uh, this is a really good example of organizational change or uh, over the course of time we begin to see significant shifts in the values of the organization, the rules, um, policies and procedures, the roles that people play. And these are the symptoms that we most frequently see. And see if you've ever seen any of these. Now, we have very few workers' comp claims. Hospitals have a lot of them with back injuries and things like that. High absenteeism, including what we call on-the-job absenteeism, where people show up for work but they're not really doing what they're supposed to be doing. Changes in coworker relationships where there's a lot of conflict. This is often seen between shifts where one shift thinks the other shift isn't holding up its end of the bargain. Sometimes conflicts uh, between different departments on the same shift, you know, comments uh, from one, like from clinical to the, to the texts and things like that. Inability uh, for teams to work well together begin to actually see a deterioration in getting uh, jobs done, um, a lot of staff complaining and challenging rules. Um, you know, we've been very fortunate. We, we don't ever have issues with aggressive behaviors between staff and clients, but in some environments they do. Uh, inability of staff to complete assignments, lack of flexibility. Um, and what we find is that the more anxious we are, the less... Um, function we have in our prefrontal uh, cortex, our kind of rational brain, to be able to problem solve. So we function much more out of what we call procedural memory than we do out of um, kind of open-mindedness and problem solving and solution focus. Um, rumors and gossips, unhealthy com uh, competition, etc. So, uh, you know, um, we see these things occasionally, uh, not not an overabundance of those, but again, we want um, we want you to be informed and educated. And so, what we find is the number one real 
um, thing that combats compassion fatigue is self-care. Um, and self-care can be broken down into a number of different uh, methods, but I tend to look at them from physical self-care to psychological, spiritual, and relationship. And so it's kind of biopsychosocial, spiritual. And so physical self-care, eating in a healthy way, exercise, getting back to the gym, getting back to you know, uh, the hot springs, um, getting a massage to kind of relax, uh, go to the doctor when we're sick. Uh, healthcare professionals are the worst people for going to the doctors. Taking time to be intimate and sexual, making, making time to be connected to other people, getting enough sleep, um, taking vacation time. Um, my last, when I was at the um, Cedar, I think I left with five weeks of vacation, which meant I went almost two years without ever taking a vacation. And that was not very healthy physically for me or emotionally for me, and I don't do that anymore. Psychological self-care, taking time to reflect, slowing down, meditating, uh, really kind of thinking about how you're doing, um, writing in a journal, doing free writing is a great exercise. Uh, go to therapy. Have someone that you can go talk to. Uh, try to decrease stress in all areas of your life. And the last one is my favorite. Be curious. Again, as we're in a high uh, anxiety state, we lose the ability to be curious because we're so busy worrying about um, surviving that we don't have the time to really think about uh, what's the best thing that we could be doing. or w Why is that person doing that? Spiritual self-care, finding a spiritual connection. You know, we work with our clients on that. It would be good for us to do that as well. Be open to inspiration, meditate, pray. Uh, and again, my favorite would be open to not knowing. We don't have to know everything. And um, the more we try to, the, the more stress we feel. Relationships, spend time with family. Stay in contact with other friends. Uh, seek out comforting activities with the important people in our lives. These are the things that go away. Remember I said that the things that we typically do to feel better are the things that tend to go away first. And so I would say these are the things that are so important. Uh, the other one, the other side, the miscellaneous, are just things that, that employees that I've talked to have said that they do. Uh, remember, supervision is a form of self-care in that you can let your supervisor know what's going on with you. There's a, an area of supervision called restorative supervision where um, a supervisor can help you begin to get restored in your, your energy and, and to feel better. Um, resourcing, which are s skills to help calm the autonomic nervous system. Uh, helping out in the garden uh, when the, you know, the gardening staff is out there and you have 10 minutes, if that's something you enjoy doing, go out and work with them. Hobbies and crafts, uh, asking for help when you need it. It's one of the things that we see in like emergency rooms and in intensive care units where people will say, I'm never going to ask for help because I don't want other people to ask me for help because I'm always in the weeds as it is. Um, and so that idea of building um, collaborative relationships in the work environment being able to ask for help when you need it. Uh, watching a good movie, going to educational activities, and laughing with coworkers. And so, um, I'm gonna skip over that. There are certain, I, I, if, if you're interested in this PowerPoint, I will, uh, if you email me at mike.barnes at foundrysteamboat Dot com, and I'll also email you these um, kind of worksheets that uh, I think are really important to be able to uh, identify the challenges in your day-to-day -day work environment. Uh, what are the sources of burnout and what are the sources of secondary trauma in your day-to-day -day activities? Uh, what are three things that you can do differently in your work life to overcome both um, the challenges of burnout and the challenges of compassion fatigue? Um, and then find other employees who are doing it as well and begin to uh, share ideas and cross-pollinate uh, ways to help one another to feel better. Um, there are two other um, pages of uh, activities 
and and it's really just a, a health care, self care, uh, kind of like a treatment plan. And what are you going to do for self care? What are you going to do for emotional self care, spiritual? I mean, what do you already do that's really helpful? What do you need to add? And then the last, um, you know, what, what list five things that you really need to do on a daily basis to be able to sustain good health in our environment. And then the last, list five things that would energize you uh, that you would like to do to fit in like every day. And so I guess in summary, um, the statistics about addiction counselors and trauma I really respect Brian Bride. He's a good guy. I went to school with him. Uh, I think his research is good, and it really worries me, to be quite honest, that it's you know, we work with a lot of trauma every day. And for those of us um, who have been in the field for a long time, um, there are very few people left working that started when we did. Most of those people have left the field. And, uh, and so... Um, I would love to see you stay with us for a very long period of time. I'm happy to talk to you about compassion fatigue. <clears throat> Excuse me, to answer any questions that you have. Um, and again, send me an email. I'll send you the, the worksheets and I'll send you the PowerPoint. So thanks for watching and um, I will talk to you later.